Hello, dear humanity. Welcome to season three of Human Thesaurus. I'm your host slash Zippy with Shronkyo Peacock. Human Thesaurus is about our mortal language, where the words we use and say are deeply attached to our sense of self and humanity. In this podcast, I fuse words with my guests and how they uniquely represent their several meanings. It's like catching up with them in a cafe or over cocktails, and here you are, eavesdropping on our conversations while we explore what words define who they authentically are. And this season, I'll throw in special episodes with deep dive human elements. So watch out for this exciting expansion of my pod. Subscribe now. Episodes are released weekly. Each season contains eight episodes and perhaps some bonuses along the way. Marcella is a poetry editor at Variety Pack magazine and has previously worked with presses and magazines, including Sampaguita Press, Marias at Sampaguitas, Timberline Review, and Copper Canyon Press. She also has published works in SOU Student Press, Flawless Mag, The Border Issue, Silk Club, Quiet, Reclamation Mag, and the anthology No Tender Fences. Asela uses her passion for creative writing to open conversations on diversity and identity in literature. She currently resides in Oregon, USA with her family. We're in completely different worlds right now. She's the night and I'm the day at the moment. And also, you can find Asela on Twitter at Asela Lee K and Instagram at The Sakura Inc. I'll provide all her links in the humanthesaurus.co show notes page. So please check that out. I met Sela through Twitter, I think 2020. Yes, during the pandemic. I remember she was looking for BIPOC contributors, even though I'm not Asian American. It picked my interest from my poetry stint. So we started talking and she's so friendly and I felt like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. She replied. That's cool. Uh, she included me to be a contributor to Chopsticks Alley Pinoy. It's a platform in the States empowering Southeast Asians to connect them to their culture's roots. It didn't really fully work out for all of us because the direction changed, I think. But I still follow Asela on her social media because she's inspiring to me. Of course, with her signature awesome hairstyle that I really, really love for her and her love for K-pop, which really is completely different from my taste. But I love observing K-pop fans. I think they're one of the most fun people in the world. And also, she's got a lot of exciting upcoming projects and things. So my synonyms for Asela are atmosphere as a noun, composing as a verb, and congenial as an adjective. Within this conversation, you'll further understand why I describe her as such. So here she is, Asela Lee Kemper. (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much, Wish. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. Thank you so much for that amazing intro. Hi, hi, listeners. My name is my name is Asela. Same as the words Bella as a noun, dancing as a verb, and creative as an adjective. I like the word poetry, and I dislike the word nice, but not in the context you think. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's unpack that one first. <laughs> Why? What, what's the context of nice that you dislike about? Because nice is a simple, positive term, but please educate us. <laughs> maybe not educate, but maybe this is from my perspective. But we all know the word or the definition of the word nice. It's mainly kind of like someone is kind or someone is friendly in terms of like talking about someone as a person. But Mm. when I'm speaking about like nice, I'm talking about like a context of, hey, you're being too nice. 
right. for me that kind of reads i already know that means like you're telling me hey you're you're going to be easily walked all over. Someone's going to take advantage of you. I don't really care mm-hmm. much about when someone say you're being too nice in that context. It's because it's kind of, for me, when I hear that, I think, so am I, should I stop caring about someone? Am I not doing it right? Mm-hmm. Or should I stop like being kind? I don't know what I'm doing. So it when you're really, they're mm-hmm. trying to say is, hey, you need to be careful you're going to be gullible. Right. Someone's going to take advantage of you because of your kindness. I understand what they're saying. It's not that my mm. kindness itself or me being friendly to others is a bad thing, mm-hmm. but it's more so of just, I wish someone would just tell me straightforward saying, Hey, I think you need to be careful because we don't know if this person is just as nice as you are, or just as kind or just playing a face, you know? So it's just mm. like, I rather have someone saying, be careful, they're going to walk all over you, you act like this, then, oh, you're being too nice. It's like you're dancing around right. the subject of like, hey, she's a very nice person. But like, I mean, I like to think I'm nice. I like to think I'm kind, but I kind of, but I like being honest and I like someone to be honest with me too. So that's why I'm like, eh, weirded out by the word nice. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. I get it now. So it's along the context of how it's being used. Mm-hmm. If it's being used to dance around something that they that that someone really needed to say, yeah. Instead of saying you're being nice, and because they're scared of, they they have the fear of getting someone offended. Yeah, but. At this point in time, everybody is just afraid of getting canceled. They forget also how to be honest yeah. with the people that, that they care about. So it 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 rubs someone the wrong way as well, right? Yeah. So instead of saying push over or gullible, they choose you're being too nice. So it it makes that thing the opposite of of what it should really, really mean. Right. So it's hard to, right? It's hard. It's it's harder to decipher if you use it that way. Like interesting that that word interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so in diff- it has a different context for different industries. So what I've learned really watching a lot of Top Chef. I think what season are they now? Twenty two or something? I, for- I can't keep up anymore. They're on their All hmm? Stars right now. They're on their Global All Stars right now. All right. <laughs> oh, I I haven't even finished season nineteen. Oh, season so, nineteen yeah, was a trip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! I'm only on like episode four or something. So please don't tell me anything. Yet. I won't. I won't. But before I could get yeah. So they use the word interesting in in culinary world when they say interesting when you offer a new food or a new creation and then when the chef says interesting that doesn't necessarily mean it's good yeah it's just interesting the concept itself it doesn't mean that it's delicious so it's it's kind of bordering on that so in your context you dislike nice because of the context itself yeah. of how it's being used so that's why i love i love this podcast concept that i have <laughs> about human thesaurus because it's all about the context yeah. per individual human being on how they reference words yeah you know yeah so speaking of all of these things what have you been doing at the moment? <laughs> You've been very busy. I mean, your intro, it's like, oh my gosh, so many different things. So w- what's going on? Yeah, I mean... Catch me up on everything. Of course, yeah. It's been a long time, about like three years now since we've interacted with each other, right? It's been three years. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> I mean... That's crazy. Right? I mean, right now, I'm going to be releasing a micro chat book in a form of a CD and a cassette from Gashing Teeth wow. Publishing. Yeah, it's the first time for them to release something like this. So it's very interesting. I'll be recording audio tracks for this micro chat book. And it's going to include like a little booklet with all the poems I included. But it's going to be released in a form of a CD and a cassette. And I'm really excited because it's like my micro chat book that I'm using it as a way to reintroduce myself as a poet because 
as you already read in the intro, I've done a lot of things, but during my time as like an editor or like a reader or just doing a lot of like different projects with li- almost a lot of literary magazines, I have a feeling like a lot of people within a community are slowly forgetting that I'm a poet before I was an editor or like a K-pop fan. So I wanted to use this as a way, like a almost like a prologue to a full collection poetry manuscript that I'm working on right now. And I want to use my micro chat book as a way to just reintroduce myself and show that I've written some pretty cool poems <laughs> over the last years. And yeah, that's one thing I've been working on. And we're hoping to have this published this year. My publisher and I were eyeing it on in the summer. So hopefully by then I get to more information come out and I can tell folks to get the micro chat book because I'm really excited about this project. And again, like I said, I want to use this as like a almost like a prologue to my full collection manuscript that I'm working on right now, as well as me recording those audio tracks for my micro chat book. Of course, I'm going to be, I'm part of the conference faculty for Willamette Writers Conference, which is the conference going to start in August. So keep an eye out for Willamette Writers Conference just to get more updates. And you might see me pop up here and there. Maybe you might see me moderating a panel about poetry. So that's what I'm excited about. And I'm going to be part of the virtual side because the conference is going to be hybrid. So it's going to be both in person and virtual. So I get to, I'll be in virtual. So you might see me in that space. Yeah. And also I'm working on a podcast with my good friend and fellow writer, Katrina M. We're doing a podcast called Two and Sync Pa. To in sync, we are recording our season two right now, and we got some pretty cool episodes that's going to come out soon. So keep your eyes and ears for that. <laughs> that's awesome. So probably we can we can do a trailer here, so we can have a little crossover. Yeah. I think you know the the podcast, the indie podcast community grows because of all of these crossovers. Yeah, this is this is how we grow. When I started this, it's never about monetization mm. or anything monetary. It's really highlighting. I, I love the concept. So I, I love really just like bringing people in, highlighting them. Yeah. What are you made of? What do you see yourself as? What, how I see yourself and all of these things and, and really at the end of it, everybody would just think, oh yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. And really like merging, um, merging humans to literary pieces as literary pieces. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing. So about your, your, your podcast, what's, what's coming up in this season two? Yeah. So last year, last year we did our season one, we kind of like we kind of played around with like different guests. We invited writers like Butch Swarskov, who made his debut with mm-hmm. Pogon Cannot Climb Trees for our special beach episode, which was kind of this fun filler episode that we <sighs> were inspired by anime. We had friends who actually, we had this conversation with our friends and they were saying like, oh, mm-hmm. you should do the, you should do like a, a beach episode, like a filter, like how anime does. And I'm like, me and Katrina were like, oh my gosh, we should totally do it. <laughs> so we mm-hmm, did that. And we mm-hmm. also invited folks from Saipikita Press as well as Maria Bolianos to talk about their debut chapbook, Sana, as well as mm-hmm. talking more about Saipikita Press along with Dina Clarice. We also talked yes. about like what it's like to be Asian Americans, especially in a liter- literary space. We also talked mm-hmm. about like different pop culture stuff like Drag Race. we me and Katrina, we love RuPaul's Drag Race. So we talked, we had an episode dedicated to that <laughs> as well as like, what it would be like if Drag Race was set in Korea? What would that look like? <laughs> we have a fantasy about mm-hmm. that. So for this season, we're going to probably do something similar to that, but hopefully with some more poems, more pop culture stuff and just being, just being fucking Asian. <laughs> So what is it like to be a fucking Asian? <laughs> you know, it has its ups and downs. <laughs> I mean, it's, it does. It does. It really does. I mean, it's you have this different diaspora we're living in because like growing up when I was trying to figure out myself is that I'm pretty proud of my heritage. 
because I'm half Korean, half Chinese, but yeah. my mom's family, mm-hmm. who's like my mom's Korean, but she was born and raised in Japan. So it's just oh. different pieces, but I'm pretty proud of my heritage. I'm pretty proud of me being Asian American. So, but I know there's some people who have like a really difficult time with that surrounding that. Like what is, what is being Asian? What is like being fucking Asian? You know, cause it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird space. It's even, I'm still trying to navigate it. And I have written like, identity poems in the past and even most of them are kind of at the center of the micro chat book here for finally the mixtape mm-hmm. that's just the title of it by the way oh yeah <laughs> and because wow okay thank you <laughs> yeah and, but it's it, a it, this is the pre-launch <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it's, it's out there <laughs> but anyways but it's yeah but being asian is just a never-ending like discovery you know just kind of navigating what that's it being is. like and because there's just so many different backgrounds like there's east asians there's yeah. south asians southeast asians and it's just so many backgrounds that needs to be cherished and uplift their voices and it's just never ending and sometimes there's some people who just have a difficulty kind of being associated with that or just like embracing it mm-hmm. because of whatever yeah. upbringings or whatever background they came from and that's completely understandable because sometimes i i had that really weird moment and that too back in college but at the same time Mm -hmm. it's just like learning how to be my authentic self and not having to like put up a front you know what i mean like trying to create this view of what people think of when they hear asian if that makes any sense yeah 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 i i (laughs) Yes, that's a lot to unpack. But it is. Uh, this is what I also appreciate about you representing about this diversity and identity in literature. And then I love the literary groups that you are around at. So what was what is your personal goal when it comes to this fucking Asian identity part in literature? Like, wh- what's your personal goal? Why are you in this space? And what do you want to imbibe in the community? Keep showing up for Asian American literature. <laughs> just keep continuing yeah. doing it. Yeah. And just literally like any background, just like not just Asian American, but also like any like Asian diaspora literature just keep uplifting mm. that because i know when i was gr- when i was a kid like for me i thought mm-hmm. asian stories only exist as like ancient china or anime those are like my only two things i thought that's the mm-hmm. only thing that exists or a stereotype but it wasn't until i picked mm-hmm. up a book by cynthia Kodahada called kira kira so mm-hmm. it's basically from a perspective of this young girl where her family, her Japanese American family moved from a big city to a small town. And it just goes Mm -hmm. into this story of what it's like to navigate this small town family and mental health. It's it's a very unique Mm -hmm. story that's like aimed towards like more middle schoolers or just YA audience. And that, that was a stamp for me that made me realize that there are stories like that through an Asian American lens. Yeah. Even, and then when I got older and I, when I got into poetry, I got to discover poets, which for me, I considered my writing heroes, like Denise Froman, Dominique mm. Christina, Christine, Andrea, Andrea Hughes, who, who's a personal friend of mine, even though she doesn't oh. identify herself as a writer anymore. But to me, like her writings that she have written during my undergrad, when we were at, we were attending the same university, that's what inspired me and I still include her in that space for me mm-hmm. and of course Fanny Choi who I'm so honored oh. to have finally met <laughs> the poet oh good yeah and because I remember watching their videos on button poetry and I remember mm. when I was in my community college watching those videos it made me realize that if they can do it so can I and I want to continue. Up- Absolutely. Right. And I want to continue uplifting that and continue using my voice and my writing to uplift those spaces and give those spaces and voices for those, like for the people who really deserve it. You know what I mean? So it's just like mm-hmm. continue uplifting that Asian American, Asian diaspora, international Asian 
writers all around, just making sure, given that voice, given that platform, and of course, uplift Black, Indigenous, Brown, Latinx, POC writers and queer writers as well. Just co- just com- keep continuing that work that I'm doing right now. And hopefully that would like venture into more <laughs> too soon. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But have you, have we ever improved these, at least these past 20 years, 15, 20, 10, 10 years at all when it comes to recognizing or representing different diasporas in this world? What do you think about that? What's your observation so far? I think it has gotten a little bit better. I, I'd say a little, I say by a hair. <laughs> it's a, it's a oh. slow baby steps for me because I, I think there's still times where I notice, and I don't know if this is the same for your end, but I noticed that at least mm-hmm. on the American side, at, at the States, that Asian Americans, at least the East Asian Americans, are the most like get the most covered when it comes to like hmm. it doesn't have to be just it's not just books, it's also like movies and music. There's always been like more of a, the forefront of like East Asian Americans when in reality it, being Asian is not just like you're from Korea or for China or Japan. Hmm. It's more than that. Yes. It's like somebody from Thailand or somebody from Vietnam, the Philippines. Mm. or even just like India, it, yes. it's more than what we saw like East Asians. It's not that to say like East Asians are like, shouldn't be uplifted. Like I, they should still be uplifted because I'm East Asian. <laughs> I'm East Asian. I'm saying yes. this. Yes. yes, but I want to, <laughs> but if we're going to include East Asians, we have to include every Asian background. You know what I mean? It's not yes. just like one singular thing. That also includes Pacific Islanders because I also noticed that yes. Asian Americans and or even just Asian diaspora in general have continuously left out Pacific Islander in conversations. I have made that mistake too and I own up to that. And just like being able mm. to bring into that space, introduce like different books by Pacific Islanders and getting to know like amazing like Pacific Islanders. If, if we want to include AAPI, we have to include Pacific Islanders into the conversations, not just like one person who happens to be Pacific Islander or someone who is uh, like indigenous, you know what I mean? Yes. I want to be able to use, utilize that space and also to learn and grow from it. So, cause I, I, like I said, I made those mistakes too. And especially in the past, and I'm probably make those same mistakes again in the future. I'm not jinxing that. I knocked on wood. I'm not gonna jinx that. No, but that's part of growth, right? Yeah. That's I think that's part of continuous education and knowledge and growth yeah. in people. We can't be perfect. So the major factor or determining factor in all of these is owning up to it, right? Yeah. Educating yourself and owning up to it. Like what you're doing. It's just being a responsible human being. So that's hard at the moment. Everybody's just jumping into the bandwagon to cancel someone and without knowing the background. Say some people just really didn't know anything better. And if they listen and change it and take accountability for it, then, then fine, right? Right. And it's just because really, it just takes time, really. And I think it's also just. Mm. It's really up to the individual person if they want to make that change because yes, it's because we talk sometimes about like cancel culture, right? Because cancel culture doesn't exist. I I, I will say <laughs> just like standpoint, it doesn't exist because mm-hmm. there's too many people who we claim that are canceled, air quoting canceled, but they're immediately come mm. back into it again because for whatever reason, it could right. it could just be because of privilege or because of like their status or whatever that reason may be, but it's really ultimately how does that individual learn? Because we can say like, oh, if we give them time and space and educate, if they get educated, yes, let them have that time to grow and learn and educate it. But if that same particular person don't do that growth or not doing that education, just continuing what they're doing, then it's, it's a matter of for time to kind of say, okay, this person didn't do anything. It's time we have to let them go. We can't keep supporting this person any longer. Mm. It's it's not for it's up for them to decide if they want to learn. But if they show that they don't mm-hmm. want to learn, obvious they obviously do not want to learn at all based on their actions. Then it's for us as an audience to decide: 
should we keep cons- supporting this person? No matter how many chances or time we keep yeah. giving them, we need to let us individually decide, should we keep supporting this person? They said it once that they'll learn, but then like two, three, five, six, numerous times, pray even worse. <laughs> They've probably done worse, you know, yeah. then that's when we had to kind of step back and think, when should we stop supporting? When should we say we can't help you anymore? Or I can't do this anymore, mm. you know? And this is same for me too. And I, that's not to say that no one is escaped from criticism. No one's escaped from like making mistakes, as yeah. you said. So it's just learning about, it's also my responsibility to, to, to think, how do I navigate the space? But also, how do I, should I learn how to educate myself? And that's why I like to kind mm-hmm. of sit and observe my surroundings, but also just like being able to kind of try to like listen to what other people are saying and just yeah. digest it and listen and if any questions I mainly ask. But I try not to use it as a, take an advantage of it in that space because mm. there are people who are giving their time to let you learn about why you made this mistake, why this is quote unquote problematic or why this is a va- is valued for, let's say, a culture or a person. So it's just acknowledging that they took this time for people to take the time to, lack of a better term, educate you, but also like taking the time to really help you under- help us understand, help you understand why this hmm. is valued and important, why it's can be hurt for, for hurtful for an individual or a community. So it's basically basic human <laughs> understanding. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. That's right. That's right. But I picked up like there's a wisdom gain there mm-hmm. that applies to a lot of things in humanity, which is when to know when to let someone go. Yeah. That's gracefulness. Yeah. When it comes to humans, when you learn that, and that's a very, very big thing in, in different communities, you can only do so much as an individual or, so, or as a group right. when it comes to educating, when it comes to making someone aware about something. It's a big wisdom. Not everybody can do that. Yeah. And, and patience. that's part <laughs> of the Yes. Yes, that's right. So that's that's another thing, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I mean, thank you for all of these because I, I feel like your messages messages that I see on social media is quite diverse um, in terms of your interests. And for me, I feel at the moment, I feel a little bit sheltered in mm-hmm. a small country and I'm not working and traveling as much as I was Mm. that I love seeing other people's view of the world in so many different ways and I could see that yours is very complex because you have a lot of interests but I always wonder like how do you do your time management because you said you're you're writing you're recording your micro chat book and then you're also editing for different literary groups and you have other interests like your podcast and many other things, I'm sure, um, <laughs> behind the scenes. So how do you manage all of that all together? Yeah, I mean, I think I wish I could tell you. That. <laughs> I, really wish I, I think I'm learning myself because right now I think that's my two main goals are, are like time management, but also learning how to live the life I wanted to, because especially mm-hmm. in the summer, I'm going to start going to grad school soon so Mm -hmm. it's just now I have to like learn how to time management like give me some time for a writing but also like get time to like if I need to apply for scholarships or jobs like if I need like a new day job or whatnot but also Hmm. if I have a day job I give time for that but also give time for my family because I live with my folks and just Mm -hmm. give some time with them and spending time with them if they need any support from me or if I need support from them just trying to learn about time management and space for that and I know I'm not doing a good the best job of it but I'm hoping for those two goals I can utilize that especially when I start grad school real soon so I, I'm still mm-hmm. learning to <laughs> still learn the process of time <laughs> management so it's a process it's slow really slow but it's it's getting there <laughs> 
I see. Well, I appreciate all your efforts. I could see that. And, you know, I what I've learned about time management for a while now is that as you evolve as a person, your time would also evolve with you. Mm. So it's how you handle routine before may change over time. So it's a never ending task, but it's always an exciting task. So I I always believe the time grows with you. Mm. So, and humans are resilient. We're resilient beings. So we can always, I think the awareness, like for example, you have a goal. So goal versus the time, when you find a common ground there, I think it's it's just good. And we can't be perfect when it comes to these things, but that's part of the evolution of yeah. of you who you are as a person. That's yeah. what I that's what I what I've gathered, <laughs> I mean, in, in my own life too. But wait, you said grad school <laughs> as an afterthought, <laughs> but it's a big deal. Yeah. Tell me about this one. Yeah, you know. Oh my gosh, you know, congratulations. Thank you. You know, I was uh, it was funny because Katrina and I we uh, recorded our first episode for our season two and I did the same thing. Yeah. And she even said, Asella, you just made a bombshell. You just said you're going to grad school. <laughs> Why you didn't say anything? I'm like, oh yeah, because I said it in the most subtle way possible <laughs> i didn't realize it either it's like those comedy skits or sometimes like tv shows where they say like oh blah 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 whatever by the way i'm doing this and then leave <laughs> which is funny yeah which is so wh- wh- what is the grad school about yeah um so the grad school i'll be attending in the summer is called Pacific Northwest College of Arts. So I'll be Mm. studying under their low residency program, which is, I don't know if this is applied to where you're, to where you are, but I know in America, Mm -hmm. when it comes to like low residency for like creative writing or like sometimes visual arts programs in for graduate schools, usually when they say low residency is when you go to campus for a certain amount of days or a week. You spend time there, get to know some people in the program and the mentors or the teachers there. And then you fly back to your Mm -hmm. home and just like do most of your studying there until you like come back again to do it all over again. But Mm -hmm. mainly for mine, what's interesting about PNCA is that I have the choice to study fully remotely. So the only time I get to go to call it go to campus is graduation if i'm able to graduate (laughs) if i'm able to graduate yes you will you're always determined i hope so (laughs) because i I saw the financial aid and i just saw like how much it'll cost and i'm like oh god i hope i do (laughs) i hope we have to look for a good benefactor for you. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I'm applying for fellowships and scholarships right now and trying to like gather as much and try to apply as much as I can. And just hopefully be able to win any scholarship and follow fellowship so I can pay for it because I saw the loans and it's so much. <laughs> I, I did apply for yes, this scholarship while I was applying for PNCA. Unfortunately, I didn't get mm-hmm. it. And I even, it's just, it's sad, but like, I'm trying to apply for as much as fellowships, grants and scholarships as, as, as much as I can, because I'm trying to avoid Mm. paying for loans as much as I can. (laughs) How long is this grad school going to be for you? About two years. So it's going from like 2023, 2024. So is this focused on um, being a poet or something else? Yeah. So I may so it's basically like poetry. So what I'm aiming mm. to do for two things while I'm studying there is just honing and focusing on my manuscript, the full collection. I already have a title for oh, my okay. full collection manuscript, but mm. I want to make sure I have, and also I have the theme for it, but I want to make sure it's refined and make sure that it's there and ready, like the poems and how, what the direction was going for for this yes. collection and also that I wanted to use that time to practice becoming like a poetry instructor and that's what like oh, I like because wow. it, it would be nice to do so and and fingers crossed those will happen because I want to be able to get a master so then then whenever I apply for like 
universities if they're look especially if they're looking for like poetry instructors i'm the mm-hmm. person for that so just like they can't say no to me because i have a master's <laughs> yes. yes wonderful i love i love this Thank but you. yeah just to dig deeper when when did you realize that you're going towards this literary path oh you know it it started in community college but i started mm. writing lyrics like song lyrics when i was yeah? in middle school because in oh. middle school i was so fascinated by like songwriters or like artists that i love like michael jackson olivia newton john or the Bee Gees. Mm. i just like i remember yes. i begged my mom to like print out those <laughs> lyrics in case like the cd doesn't oh. have any like lyrics in the lyric book so i would yeah. ask my mom to like <laughs> print them out that's so we found a website and i would just like i still have some of the <laughs> songs i would like highlight which one saying like this is my favorite or this is my second favorite or this is my favorite Aww. and i'm always so fascinated by it and at first i want to be like a lyricist kind of like what broadway mm. or like movie producers have but then i googled yes what it's like working as a lyricist <laughs> and i was like <laughs> oh i had to Let's just say I have to rethink how I'm going to approach it. Yeah. So it wasn't until I went to community college when I moved up to Oregon is when I took like an introduction to poetry class. And I mm. I wanted to take it because it kind of is similar to ly- writing lyrics. So I thought, okay, maybe I can mm-hmm. try this. So I wrote, I don't remember what poem I wrote, but I remember I wrote it out of sheer scaredness that they'll probably say, hey, maybe this is not for you, you know? But then when I read my right. poem in class, they were they they were pretty excited. They had a lot of good things that, to say about my poem. And I was shocked. I was really <sighs> shocked. And then that led me to Denise Froman, who is like one of my favorite poets ever. And also my writing, mm. po- my writing heroes. And it was like the Dear Straight People poem. And then it also led me to Dominique Christina, mm. And then eventually led me to Franny Choi, who I had the honor to meet in person. By the way, wow. I met Denise and Dominique in person. So that's, that's like pretty cemented. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, but it, Franny Choi, I got to meet recently at AWP Seattle. For me, when I saw Franny Choi, the first time I saw Franny Choi was watching their videos on Bun Poetry. And I remember watching yeah? those videos. Yeah. And I remember watching those videos. That's where I knew I wanted to continue poetry. I want to continue writing. And I don't know how at the time, I didn't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to like become this working professional being paid poet. How do I'm going to do it? But I'm going to do it. (laughs) I'm going to do it no matter what. And I, yeah. And I want to continue doing that. So that's how it all started. It is what started as a hobby eventually became a, thing I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Wow, I love that. That's that's such an inspiration to aspiring writers. I think it's Thanks. just all about just doing it, right? Just yeah. just do <laughs> start somewhere, just write and start yeah. somewhere. Yeah, so coming from this, I always feel that you are always representing and I love what you represent as well. So Mm. what do you envision? What are your goals for this literary path that you have in Mm. writing and most especially in poetry communities that you serve? Yeah, I'm hoping to be, like I said, after Hopefully I graduate (laughs) when I pay off, not having to take too much loans. Hopefully to be a poetry instructor and just be able to teach poetry to students, especially like younger audience and just be able to allow them to have a a voice and space and just, well, not just young Mm -hmm. age, but it's just like every age, all ages. And I want to be able to teach, like be a poetry instructor and continue uplifting BIPOC, queer literature, Asia, Asian diaspora, Asian American literature, just could keep continuing that while being a poetry instructor. I want to continue mm-hmm. being a poetry editor or like an editor for literary magazines well, as long as I get paid. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> besides my time at Variety Pack, shout outs to everyone at Variety Pack. We're doing great work. Besides, folk, besides Variety Pack, I've kind of... Since last year, I've been burned out from 
mm. doing editorial stuff. I've been pretty burned out. So I wanted to like kind yeah. of refocus how I want to, especially now that I have a micro chapbook coming out and I'm working on a manuscript, yes. a full collection manuscript. I wanted to re-navigate myself as a poet, as a writer, and just be yeah. and how I want to utilize that voice. And I actually enjoy doing uh, becoming a poetry instructor because I was an instructor uh, during my alum university's youth program. And we did mm. it for the summer. I did it for a week. The students I worked with were amazing and made me love the work and made me want to continue doing the work. So right. it really motivated me to kind of continue that and just focus on my writing and be in that space for that. That's, so that's my goal. And I also have like a retirement plan. <laughs> I also have like a oh, retirement plan. I love plan. this. Yeah, I have a... Can you tell me a little bit more about that? This is so inspiring. Yeah, you know, like a lot of people say like, do you have a, what's your long-term goal or like what is your dream per se? Like I'm already living my dream and that is like being a poet, oh, being a, a writer. Yes. At least for me. I mean, mm. it could be bigger. I want to make, of course it'll be bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's always been that kind of dream. That's one of my long-term goals is like continue being a poet, continue being a writer. But my retirement mm -hmm. plan is like, after all of this, whatever, whenever that time comes, after all of this, I want to open up my own bookstore. So <laughs> yeah, I want to open up my own bookstore and just having that space where I always, I have it all written down too. Just have it like, but the shortness oh, wow. of being kind of like what Kunokunia bookstores which is like one of my favorite bookstores yes. ever just having be like a space oh, yes. for like yeah for being like so many awesome books just like continuing uplifting local writers in the area BIPOC queer and just having the drag queen reading hour it also is like a space for poetry readings as well as open mic and I was in a poetry slam club when I was in undergrad yes and I want to have that space for them to be there and have that poetry reading and just also having that space where people can listen to music. And if I want to make a bigger space, I also wanted to have like, I wanted to have it to be the space. It's not, it might not happen, but I always wanted to, but have like that space and have that space where of college students be able to kind of stay for the night because there has, when I was an undergrad, there has been a lot of issues and problems with houselessness or homelessness or just like oh. student or just students mm. do not have a place to stay and sometimes they would go out yeah. like really late and studying for the library and it gets day out late and it's too late to walk home and it's dangerous to walk home so yes i wanted to have like a space where it's kind of like a hostel kind of similar to what right. japanese or korean bookstores have like a little cafe where they have a little little yes. room but i also want to have a yeah. room where it's like people can check out and check in so they can stay if they need yeah. to study they can stay in their room sleep there and i don't know the logistics of course i haven't worked out the logistics yet but that's kind <laughs> of my ideal to have like a space for college students if they need a place to stay for not the whole year, but like at least for like some time for them to, especially if they need to study for finals, it's too late for them to go back home. It's too late to get them an Uber or something like that. Just having that mm -hmm. room, that space so they can study and then sleep without having to worry that they have to walk home at night. That's, that's, yes. the, that's what I hope for my retirement plan is to open up that bookstore. Oh my gosh, that has to happen. <laughs> if Don't I have give to, up on that one. I won't, and I won't. I, I wish that exist everywhere, you know, yeah. like that's a very beautiful vision, Asela. It's just, wow. Thank you. I could even picture it in my head how it's going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, like, I, I just like to, I hope that happens. Like, of course, not now because I don't, of course, I have no funds and I'm kind of busy right now. My head's going on right now, mm. but I hope. And you said it's retirement plan. Yeah, it's a retirement plan. <laughs> that's the, that's, that's when I hopefully like after all of this and finally got my, once I got all of my shit together, <laughs> then I can yes. finally, then maybe this will be my <laughs> retirement plan. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very inspirational that I could see that happening and that's very marketable and it's going to be very good to different college communities. Yeah. So yes, I support you on that part. Thank you. <laughs> I hope your vision will come true. I know it will. You're very determined when it comes to these things. Oh, thank you. So 
Yes. So in closing, mm. what's the word that you can think of that you can impart to our listeners and why? Mm. Like when you, when you say impart, what do you mean by that? So after our conversation, what's the word that you can pick up oh. that you can share to our listeners? And, and what does that word mean to you? Determination is, mm-hmm. I feel like that's the theme of this part for our episode because I feel like just hearing you and having that energy just being able to work and improve and not lose hope or lose that vision of where I wanted to go and just not losing that passion or why I'm here to begin with Mm, I love that thank you so much thank you so much for hanging out with me it's so nice catching up with you Asela and getting to know you better Um, this is a wonderful thing because all we do is email each other and see each other on social media so this is this conversation really means a lot to me so thank Thank you so much for guesting really really appreciate it and good luck to your (laughs) grad school and Always stick to that retirement plan. It really, really sounds amazing. (laughs) Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. I had such a good time. And I'm so grateful to be able to have this space and talking with you and catching up with you. I'm so excited to just seeing season three. Congratulations on season three. (laughs) And your season two. (laughs) All good. Yes. Hail indie podcasters. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. And also can't wait for your audio micro chat book. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. The poems I've written, written for the past two years. I'm very excited. And I will definitely announce it on my social media. And hopefully you'll like it too. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Trust me. Thank you. <laughs> From this episode, one of the most important words about life is willpower. It is the strong determination that allows one to do something difficult. It's similar to words determination, commitment, dedication, tenacity, backbone, self-control, spine, and self-restraint. Juliana, the Venezuelan vixen Peña, the first woman to win the ultimate fighter, quoted, Will power, strength, and determination, it will take you places. End quote. Not everything goes according to plan. Plans always change and divert and diverge. It really depends, but life is just really like that. It always takes us by surprise and we also discover new things. I think the biggest factor when it comes to moving forward is that willpower. Willpower to survive, willpower to succeed, willpower to endure everything that we're going through at some point in our lives. I think it's just important for us to have that willpower in our minds, in our hearts, and in our souls to keep on going with this surprising life. And that's what's beautiful about what we're here for. Thank you for listening to Human Thesaurus. Please help me rate and subscribe because your support means a great deal. Join me again next week for another episode. And while waiting, why not listen to my past few episodes? You may find one of them riveting. I'm your host, Wishurongiyo Peacock. Have a fantastic day and thanks for listening.